Welcome back to another episode of Talking Classical with me, Annabelle. I'm absolutely delighted to present this interview I recorded on Thursday with leading American baritone Nathan Gunn. Now, if you love your opera, Nathan will be a very familiar name. He has performed in the major opera houses. He has also had a very successful career in musical theatre and has had new roles written for him. You'll also hear about his many other varied activities in in this podcast as well. So I was very lucky enough to be able to meet Nathan at his home in North London, where he is currently staying, as he is starring as Danilo in English National Opera's production of The Merry Widow, Lehar's operetta. So straight after this podcast, book your tickets to go and see The Merry Widow, to see Nathan. It runs at the Coliseum until the 13th of April, so you haven't got long. But in this interview, um, Nathan and I talked about all sorts of things. And if you're a young singer listening to this podcast in particular, I really hope that you're going to be inspired by what you hear and that you might take away some of Nathan's wonderful advice and thoughts. I'd also like to extend a massive thank you to Stacey at Groundswell Theatricals for arranging this interview and of course to Nathan for um, agreeing to participate in the podcast and very kindly allowing me to come to his lovely, lovely house. We actually arranged this interview within the space of about two days, um, <laughs> which is virtually unheard of, as you all know, in the classical music world. If you don't know Nathan, then please also, after this interview, go away and look at all his stuff that he's done. Um, Nathan really is just an amazing, but also one of the nicest people. Don't forget that you can also listen to my previous interview with the lovely British soprano Alison Langer, who is currently starring in the National Theatre's revival of Stephen Sondheim's musical Follies. Don't forget you can also subscribe to the Talking Classical podcast. You can follow Talking Classical on Facebook, Twitter, and on the Talking Classical blog. Enjoy listening to this interview with Nathan Gunn. How's the run going with Great. Nathan? Great. We had a show last night, yeah? and uh, I love the cast. I love ENO. I love the family that is there. I realized I've worked in London for 20 some years, right? Mm -hmm. But I've spent the majority of my career in Covent Garden or with uh, LSO or Glyndebourne, and this is. London's mm. Opera House. Mm. And so mm. people have lives. They yeah. live here. They get their kids to school. They come to work. They get back in order to you know, time to give them dinner. They're as normal as artists can be. Mm -hmm. And usually I'm with international people who are, you know, all yes. over the place. It's yeah. a really hard lifestyle. And, yeah. and this has been great. And I've seen so many friends because yeah. they all come to ENO. Oh, okay. I'm like, oh, Nathan, I haven't yeah. seen you. Jonathan, yeah. great to see you. And it's, yeah. it's been great. I think it was the day before the recital, Julie and I went to see um, All About Eve because oh, Julie, yes. yeah, Julie Nevin oh, is yes. a friend of ours. Yes. So, oh, really? oh. Yeah, so I got to see him in that show, which was great fun. And we saw Caroline for okay. change, of change, for change. So we've you know, managed to see a lot of different things. And, you know, and of course, everyone who's in uh, Ripper right now, the women that are, I mean, it's, if, if you get a chance to go, mm -hmm. it's like you'll never see those women on stage together except in this situation. Really? And I know a lot of them. I know the man who now, you know, is in, who runs, you know, I've known him for a while. Sarah's married to a guy, did a Jonathan Dove TV piece with uh, Man on the Moon. They're just all over. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's been wonderful. And how's, how's the Coliseum I love compared it. to other venues you've performed in? I think in, in well, Wigmore Hall, first of all, is the best recital hall on the planet, and they should just copy it and put it everywhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> Definitely. The Coliseum, I mean, people sometimes worry that it's too big. I think it's better than Covent Garden, personally. I think it's got a better acoustic. I think uh, the audience is there because they want to be there and not necessarily to see somebody and then leave an intermission. It's easy to sing in. It could use a little more backstage space. <laughs> and maybe sometimes when it rains, the sewers you know, get a little bit smelly, but besides that, mm -hmm. no, it's, uh, it's great. It's mm -hmm. a great location. The Met in New York is my, I, guess, I suppose, my home house, and it's almost twice as big, so it's, the size doesn't bother me. You yeah. just have to kind of face out and shout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and how about how did you find the, um, the audiences here in London? Well, they're different depending on where they go to. I yeah. was thrilled. Um, I mean, the audience for Naughty Marietta has been great. The translation has a ton of British humor to it, and uh, they've been... Uh, Terrific, really engaged and fun and receptive, and um, and it's the same thing at Wigmore Hall. You know, the 
it was a we were really not sure how they would react to that program but everybody as you know loved it mm. and uh really bought into the idea and heard music they never heard before mm. i think it was a very different audience though compared Probably. to the standard Woodmore i'm Hall sure audience. i'm sure a lot, so. there are a lot of young people there definitely which was great yeah that's something that you know julie and i think about a lot because we're both professors also at the university of illinois mm -hmm. At this stage in the game, I, I really feel like part of what I'm doing up there is hopefully being a positive example for mm. the people who are going to take the baton and run with it. So where did it all begin for you then? I sort of happened into it. I was, I'd always been asked to be in shows when I was a kid yeah. you know, in school. My mom thought, well, you know, you can probably make a little bit of money singing at like, you know, wedding ceremonies and stuff like that. <laughs> so she gave me voice lessons. And the, the man who was teaching at the local university asked me to be in their version of the magic flute to do Papageno. It was the first time I ever did. <laughs> I was 17. And I didn't know. It was like a musical, which it sort of is. And so I did it, and it kind of caught that bug. And then I thought, well, I'll audition for music schools and see if I get in. And I got into all of them that I auditioned to. I decided to go to the University of Illinois, where I'm now a professor. Ended up finding a great voice teacher who taught me really everything about how to sing. And then spent my undergraduate performing uh, Schubert's leader with uh, an accompanist named John Wustman, who played for all the greats. It was an amazing education because it, you know, it was a Bachelor of Arts education, but I sang with him. He told me once like 160 different Schubert songs and performed those songs over 350 times. So it was an amazing education. And then right from there, one of the Met to Brothers and Opera Young Artist National Council auditions and went to the Met to be in their Young Artist program and then started singing opera everywhere. Mm. So it kind of found that the opera world finds you if you are if you have a voice to do it mm -hmm. and uh, have the temperament. Well, even if you don't have the temperament. Mm -hmm. but, but that's how it all began. And I've been enjoying, I think that singing is the way I communicate best with people. Mm. And so I... Mm. And did you know that you always had a voice? Not really. And you, you don't, I mean, as a boy, I had a pretty voice, but then your voice changes. Of and course. You don't know. And, and, but, it, you know, eventually... If, I just thought everyone keeps asking me to sing, so maybe they like it. And uh, so I pursued it. I've been primarily an athlete, which helped because I, you know, you can tell when you have a good coach, because singing is really not much different than learning any other physical activity. It's coordination of movement in order for it to be healthy. And then as you get older, your voice changes a little bit, it gets louder and darker sometimes or whatever, and, and you just uh, stay on the path. The weird thing is I can't hear what I sound like, nor can you, you've heard recordings of your own voice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. And you're thinking. So uh, I just kind of uh, let that go. People want to hear it. Great. If they're receptive to it, wonderful. And if not, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and was the goal always to be a singer? No. Or did you consider other... Once I decided to learn how to sing and do it, I put all my eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. I just said, well, I don't think you can go about this halfway. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, no, although I'm involved in obvious, I mean, you're as you know, as things progress, you tend to hopefully you know, find different interests, and so uh, obviously teaching is one of them, and 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 I've directed a couple of times, which I enjoyed. And Julie and I have a production company where we're trying to do shows that can sort of be a, a middle step for people who are graduating, but don't necessarily have that next professional gig, so they're able to work with us and. Um, and I, I'll shoulder the burden of whether people like it or not, and they mm. don't need to worry about it. And I'm a, a co-owner in a city club out in Los Angeles where we have, um, well, it's a city club. It's a, it's a long story, but it's uh, also another sort of culturally based uh, space where, um, you know, we have different parties for openings of shows or albums. Um, one of the spaces has, one's in a hotel, uh, RVCC, Reserve Vault City Club, and uh, another one is uh, Intersect, where it's a coffee shop, but also meals, and a tattoo parlor's in it, mm. and a barbershop. And, but it promotes the kind of, it embraces culture, mm -hmm. and the culture of LA or whatever city we're in, where people can gather, because we're so used to, you know, electronic yes, communication. Of course. And this is, and it's something we're, devoted to. We even have an analog room where, you know, you shut off all your devices <laughs> and you can work, but mingle with people who have similar interests as yourself. 
leader? Was that initially what you started out in and then you branched into other... It, it was absolutely primarily leader. Mm-hmm. It was song. It was always song. That was my decision. Okay. I ended up being an open studies major with a focus on German art song. So okay. Schubert did that. And so I took poetry courses and classes and I performed a lot of Franz Schubert songs and that song singing I think is probably my and that kind of recital either one piano and me and Julie or me Julie and Mandy Patinkin for example and we do it with another piano and we do a show together <laughs> yeah yeah you know wow. it's this or, you know there are other you know and others but Mandy and I you know we do a show and we, we collaborate with I collaborate with a lot of artists from from different uh, you know different places and and I, th- I think that it, it serves both of us really well and we're putting together a new one called dry town that's kind of going to be like a <laughs> it's sort of like a talk show cabaret and we'll bring in guests like we, we're going to have one guest who's a tai chi master and a dancer and then another woman who's really quirky who is uh, a uh, entomologist and she started this thing called the insect fear festival or something like that shows movies about gigantic bugs and things but she studies bees and other bugs and she's really and and we'll get them to sing we'll have theme music and i'll try out some stuff they do and and uh it's a multimedia type thing we want to reach people in you know whatever way we can and and uh even if it 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 turns out even if it's something as little as, for example, when I, I sang Billy Budd with uh, LSO, we won a Grammy for that. They, they were saying, well, you know, the London Symphony Orchestra, it's our, you have to wear uh, tails because that's what we do. And I'm like, Billy Budd and tails? It just seems mm-hmm. weird. I mean, so yeah. after fighting quite a bit, they allowed us, the, the, who were regular seamen in, this, in the story, to wear like black pants and black sweater. And then it kind of went up in formality as it went up in rank. And you could see audience members responding differently because we looked like them. And all of a sudden, that barrier wasn't there. And I think uh, uh, Julie and I, uh, when it comes to that sort of thing, uh, have really tried quite a bit to get rid of the smoke and mirrors Mm -hmm. and and let people realize no art's going to be made in a performing arts thing if, if we're not communicating and if we don't create a situation where people feel comfortable and welcome. So is that important to you then um, in the in the concert halls, in, in the opera, well, wherever you're performing, is that important to, I suppose, break down those barriers? I think it's about all of that. Mm-hmm. I think it's absolutely that. Of course, you know, when you're in a, playing a character in an opera or an operetta, you have to play that character. So it's a part of you, but it's not you. So it's a slightly different feeling like I could play a part where, for example, um, the rape of Lucretia in in Vienna that I did. I remember the woman playing Lucretia. Her mother came and she's like, "How could you let him do that to you?" And she's like, "Well, <laughs> he's actually a very nice guy. That's just the character he's playing, yes. right?" But I I really think that the 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 amazing thing about singing is that we all sing. I mean, we all do. Uh, from a from a very small age and and the miracle about it is that all singing is is your body vibrating right your vocal mm-hmm. cords buzz and yes. like this zzz, then yeah. your body vibrates and then you're able to form words which is amazing and then that vibration is carried out to the audience so um, for me yeah it's absolutely and completely about communicating to the audience and by that not putting up any sort of resistance, not necessarily a barrier, but, mm. you know, any kind of resistance to them. Mm. And and does the repertoire help as well? Like yeah. With, with, say, for example, the recital on sure. Sunday? Mm-hmm. Well, I think the, the first and foremost is it being in the language people speak. Because once people start reading instead of listening, you use a different part of your brain. So, yeah, that makes a huge difference to me. Um, we put together a program of music that we feel is ours, and we try to put it in a way that helps, even though you've got something like, you know, Cake, and you have something than Charles Ives, or Tom Waits, you know, and, and I don't think we had any Sam Barber on there, but John Musto, or, or um, um, uh, Ben Moore, or Gene, you know, the, even, though they're, even though they're very different, you can, if you do it right, the job is to make an art song sound like a folk song and a folk song sound like an art song. You yeah, know what I mean? Definitely. And, the, and that's what we try to do. Yeah. And I think you do if you just, if you're honest about it. And if it's good music. I think sometimes there can be a little bit of that snobbery still in the classical circles. Sure. Classical singers singing musical theatre and jazz and actually 
because you sing truthfully and you sing with integrity, that actually comes across to us as the audience. And mm -hmm. actually, you know, you kind of change my mind. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, you know, it's it's funny when I first started singing Tom Waits' music. So I think I think he's a, a genius, but uh, you know, you, it's hard to find the written stuff. So we, we started with, I just said, okay, listen to this whistle down the wind, right? You know, you hear him, he's like, ah. Yeah, he's got a voice like the devil. He's like, that's awful. I'm like, just play it and let me sing it. She's like, wow, that's a beautiful song. You know, so you kind of have to listen for it sometimes, but uh, if it's a good song, it's a good song. I don't care who wrote it or when it was written, you know, they, and you can tell because they kind of sound like they come from the earth and, uh, you know, people respond to it. And what about that Charles Ives? <laughs> General William yes, that was in the heaven, yeah. That's How do crazy. people usually respond? They, they, uh, like, huh? I mean, some people. Some <laughs> I people, love that anecdote. In the front row, he's just like. Really? <laughs> he goes, huh. <laughs> huh. You know, and, and that's okay. I mean, it's a hard song to get, to get, you know. It's an amazing song, though. It's an amazing song, and he was so far ahead of it. I mean, still, he's. Yeah, definitely. He's, he's his own. You know, as a quote from him, he said, I don't know which is worse, the music or the, or the words, right? <laughs> you know, it wasn't about that song, but a, a different one. And I, yeah, I just think that the music is meant to be a vehicle for the words, which if you, when you do it right, you kind of forget about the music. It just has an impact on you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and hopefully it doesn't sound as hard as it is because it's, it's crazy difficult when it comes to rhythm changes and trying to find pitches and the whole thing but you know my job during a performance is not to worry about that my job is to say okay that work has all been done now let's communicate it. how did you get into his music um i i don't know actually i think i i was I, you know it's one of those things where you i, I heard about him or maybe i i heard a recital of someone saying some of his music or julie and i were kind of going through different things and i was looking at the text and i thought wow this is crazy and then we go through it and i'm like man that's a wild romp, you know, yeah. just a wild romp. And then you have something that like circus band where it's so kid-like. Um, and, and other ones that are just, um, you know, that I didn't put on there that, are, that just sound like, oh, it's a, it's a little, it's a beautiful little song about a nostalgic memory of growing up in a certain place in New England where the, the town has a little red, you know, a house over here and then there's the church and it's, and it oh yeah yeah it starts this really weird chords visions of my homeland and it sounds weird and then just goes into way down east in a village by the sea yeah. and it goes you know and that has a little quirky weird things in the middle of uh -huh. it but it's because he was so because he was financially independently rich he could just write whatever he wanted to and that's what he did he uh, they moved his uh, they the um, he get, all of his music was given to it's an institution in in New York and a lot of the proceeds of that music it wasn't worth anything when they, it was given to him in the estate but it's so valuable now that they've been able to fund all sorts of new composers with it and when they sold his house up in New England they moved all of it into this particular building on 150th Street and with his piano. And his piano was this upright, awful piano. <laughs> and and to, for the inauguration, they asked me to come with Julie and to play some of his songs on it. And it was, you could hear, I mean, he composed everything, all his symphonies, everything. He's looking out with a, a window onto, you know, the, and, and, write, and playing on this awful piano. <laughs> but that was, you know, it didn't matter. It was in his head and, and, uh, uh, and he just wrote what he wanted to write. And, uh, and, and I think that's something that spoke to me when I heard his first, the first songs I ever heard from him. Mm -hmm. And what about um, the other repertoires you were singing in the recital, mm -hmm. the, the Tin Pan Alleys, the, um, the jazz, the pop? There's such a wide variety of repertoire from that particular period of time. And when we put a program together, obviously it can only, I mean, an hour and a half is about as long as we should make it. I don't like intermissions because I think it cuts everything and it chops things up too much. Mm -hmm. um, we we wanted, you know, we, we love those eras of song. They fit my voice really well. And I like that really time good. period and the words and the sentiment and about love and, you know, or Lonely Town is kind of, it sounds sad, but it's actually uplifting. You know, when there's love, the world's a better place, you know, and every town, you know, and without it, every town's a lonely town. I mean, it's a beautiful thought. And, and if, this, if the, the music is beautiful and, the, and, you know, and Julie enjoys playing it, and I like the text, we give it a shot and see. 
how it fits in. Mm -hmm. Tin Pan Alley stuff, like Brother Can You Spare a Dime was my grandpa's, one of his favorite songs. And I've always thought people tend to soft pedal that song a bit, you know, like, hey man, can I have a little bit of money? When they were in, <laughs> at that time, they were in desperate straits and somebody, he wasn't asking at the end of it. He was like, give me, a, I need money or I will die. And when you're faced with that situation, I, I, I think that song has teeth to it that I, I like putting into it, you know? Uh, but Julie has an interesting history. You know, her, her dad is a physicist and, um, she spent, she was born in uh, Hamburg, Germany, and then grew up for, I don't know, five years or something in Aachen while he was doing some physics stuff. And then she moved out to San Francisco, but he always loved to sing, and her mother is a, a music teacher and a pianist, so they would go up to um, Jackson, California, I think it's called Jackson, and they would, it's an old mining town, and, and stay there for a week or so, and they would have, it was called Dry Town, and they would have they would just do all these vaudeville shows, a bunch of amateur musicians. And so she learned a ton of repertoire and just, you know, with, and her mother still has books and books of all this stuff. And so, I mean, some you can't do now because it's really, it's really like racist and off mm, color. That's yeah. really, it's yeah, yeah. really awful. So I we, do. you know, we're like, nah, I don't think that's going to yeah, be good. Yeah. But some of it is, is still just fantastic. So we, we zip through all of that music and, um, and see what really strikes us. And she may make a new, her own arrangement of it to, you know, yeah, to modernize it a bit or to give it our flavor. And yeah. uh, um, and if we like it and it fits in the program, we add it. If not, we'll do it later. Yeah, you looked like you were just giving it everything in. Um, Absolutely. Brother, please, oh brother. yeah, you that were was giving it all. that was that was me. That was his. That was every. That was that was a whole scope. That was, that was and, like you. It was, that, that down was, to a T. That, that there was no holds bar on that uh, uh, barred on that particular song. Mm -hmm. and is that is that important for you as well? That when yeah. you're on stage as well, that you're you're giving it all to I, the audience as well. I've, yes, I think that's my job. I think it's every performing artist's job. Um, and uh, the only performances I really have regretted are the ones where I either was so distracted I phoned it in, or so self conscious it wasn't good and, and to me that's you know breaking a contract with the audience mm -hmm. no matter how I feel you know sometimes you feel better or less good or you're sick or whatever you, I, I think we're you know we're human beings every day is a little bit different every hour is a little bit different and my job if they had the audience had the generosity you know of spirit to show up and be there and sit there and listen to what I have to say I'm going to tell them what I have to say and uh, some are there to are willing to accept it and it's good some not and you know either way you part as friends at the end but you never know if you don't actually commit mm. so that's what i do and uh and that it's when it, when you do it right it's it's a tremendous joy mm. it really is mm. and that's singing for me for some people it's playing for some people it's it, it's interviewing for some people it's you know nursing or or you know you ever go to a, a restaurant where the the server or a diner you know she's been there for like her whole life and she takes care of you and she's like honey let me take care of you i'll get a cup of coffee or whatever that's like the most when they're really good at that and that's their calling it's the most generous welcoming mm -hmm. wonderful thing and, and uh, for a recital particularly a recital where it's me and it's julie or it's me and you know you can't control what other people do but or mandy or whomever uh I, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a, it's my, it's not just my job, it's my uh, pleasure to be able to offer that up. And, um, and when you do it right, it, like I said, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a, a wonderful feeling of communion with your, with your fellow human beings. As a singer, mm -hmm. you can't hold back as a singer because because you have to, you have to emote, you have to engage to the audience. And I suppose maybe with instrumental playing, you can sort of, you have maybe a, more, of, you have a barrier, you have mm -hmm. the stand, you have the instrument. Um, whereas with singing, it's just you. And you're facing the audience. And there's no fourth wall. Nope, you're opening your mouth yeah. and your body's vibrating mm -hmm. at them. You know, it's, it's very uh, uh, vulnerable. You know, when I was, I was actually here in London. I was getting ready to um, 
do Billy Budd for the first time in Chicago, and I I was going through the first, going through the music, and, and Veer at the beginning said something about at the Battle of Salamis, and I didn't know what the Battle of Salamis was, and so I spent some time in the British Library, and I was looking at the score and and reading about the Battle of Salamis, which happened after the Battle of Thermopylae, which essentially saved the West from becoming Persian when Xerxes tried to invade. And I started reading more um, of Greek philosophy and and learning a little bit about the Spartan culture. And they were, you know, they were always in camp. They're really warlike culture, although strangely enough, really liberal. Like the women were educated the exact same way and they considered women as Sparta. That was their culture. The men were not. But the strangely enough, the being this big macho fighting culture, the two things that they admired most about any man was his ability to fight in a phalanx and his ability to sing in front of people because they thought that they were two scariest things to do, right? <laughs> you know? And it is scary but um, and vulnerable, but um, the reward is great, you know, and even, but even other instruments, you know, once again, like a cello, you're wrapping your body around it and it becomes part of that person. The same thing with, I think, almost any other instrument. Some of the electronic ones might be a little bit uh, even more of a distance, but there's something about being engaged with your thoughts and having a real belief that what you're thinking about is going to be carried through that sound, that it that it travels in a super direct way. Mm -hmm. But once again, you got to be engaged. If you're not there, if there's no there, there, there's that can be really boring like i always say opera can be one of the best experiences ever or it can be absolutely the worst Definitely. like you're feeling like <laughs> your life is being stolen from you have you ever seen that t-shirt life is short opera is long no oh that's a good one. Oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, right, right. yeah so, so how much of you when you're on stage how much of you is i suppose you being vulnerable and then how much of you is you i suppose being the character or I suppose putting on a persona? When it's a recital, it's all me. It's my experiences in life. I'm putting them in, uh, into the, infusing them into the songs. I'm using the words of the poet or the librettist and the, the sound of the composer to tell my story because they're better at that than I am. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it's a, a, a character, I spend a lot of time uh, observing people like you know how they walk and how they move and maybe expressions they make depending on where they are what they're doing and I usually steal that and put it into certain characters that I know on stage and that's you know and that's acting I guess uh, and I and I still try but I, I'm always trying to tell a real story but through the filter of the character that I'm playing Mm -hmm. So it's not so much me on stage in a show mm -hmm. unless it's written about me. So I've done a one-man show that's actually about my life mm -hmm. in a context of a certain thing, that an accident that happened to my father. So it's really a story about a father and son. Mm -hmm. But in a recital, it's just, it's, that's, that, you just, that's me. You know more about me by going to the recital than most people probably. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you someone who's very comfortable about opening up on stage then? The on stage, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's for me. It's actually perfect because everybody's sort of sitting quietly, and I can, in order, and I can talk to them <laughs> as opposed to what it is like usually, where people are kind of chaotically moving around, and you're trying to get your voice heard. I'm really uh, fortunate for that. I have I've had all these opportunities throughout my life to be able to, for an hour and a half, um, say what I have to say and have people listen. Could you tell me a bit more about some of the thought processes that are happening in your head when you are singing, um, technical level, emotional level, mm -hmm. psychology? Feel free to interpret the <clears throat> sure. question in whatever way you wish. Well, I, th I think that evolves. You know, I think sometimes, honestly, what you witnessed on Sunday was, for me, a, a watershed moment. I think it has something to do with, uh, honestly, being here and working for, you know, three months at ENO. I don't usually spend that much time rehearsing a piece. Usually it's a much faster process and I'm in and out 
but I wanted to do this. I wanted to sing it, you know, I wanted to take time and I didn't know why, but I did. Well, I understand why now. I, I think, it, you know, that during this process of being here, it, you know, was sort of a, gave me time to reevaluate a little bit about what I want to do with the next 20 years of my career and why I do it. And it occurred to me that maybe this is the stage of life or something, and maybe it's something that everybody eventually, once they get to either step past that, go over that barrier, step past that thing, or just say, oh no, I'm not going to go there. It's just too, you have to be too vulnerable. But um, up to that point, usually what I would think about is, okay, I'm prepared. What's the hall sound like? You know, how am I feeling? I'm going to sing this song, that song. What's the order? And then you're into the song and then maybe a hard part comes up and you have to think a little bit technically about it. Okay. And that's good. I mean, you're there about 90% of the time and that's what the best you can hope for. I decided the day of the performance, you know, I, I was, Julie and I were sitting here and, and I just sat down in this chair and and went through the recital in my head. I went through the whole thing. I saw it. I knew what I wanted to say in this. I thought a lot about the words. And then, and then we went about our day and we went to the hall and practiced a few things to make sure a couple of... There are a lot of those songs that sound easy that actually change meters quite a bit. And, and you have to get it, you have to get it in your head, yes. right? And you have to make sure... Rather than seeing it in your head, you have to kind of hear it in your head and know how it, what I call, goes, you know. Mm. And we did that. And then in preparation, I just decided, well, that's all done. And what I'm going to do in this show is I'm going to create absolutely no barrier with the audience. I want to, I am going to think about why I love doing this. I'm going to think about how grateful I am that I can. I'm going to think about sharing. I'm going to think about, you know, the joy that happens when it's done right. And I'm not going to think about any technical vocal stuff at all. And the, of course, the irony is you sing better when you do, because you're not self-conscious, mm. right? You're not tripping over yourself. Mm. And so for me, that was, that was the first time, and hopefully not the last, because I think I have a way, I know what it feels like, where I was absolutely 100% there. And, and the funny thing is, you leave and you think, well, you don't, your standard is not based on what people think then. Your standard isn't, is the review going to be good? Or is this person who's coming going to like it? Not important. The standard was and is only in the now of the show. And then it's done. And you offered it up and let it, you know, resonate out, move on to your next thing. And that's a, I guess the word is a freeing. That mm -hmm. is, it was, a, it's a very freeing feeling, but mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time and a lot of persistence and a lot of preparation and many hours all that stuff, but you know, I can tell anybody who's listening, who's a singer right now, you do that, you know, you always get to the point where you think I'm going to quit or this is too hard or this is not good or I can't ever get there. Keep working at it. Keep going. It's always when you get to that point that most people quit. But if you get past that point, wonderful things happen mm -hmm. and you, it, a whole new world sort of opens up. It's like a, the, the windows were open and the doors blew off their hinges. Totally. And, and you look at such ease on stage as well. I mean, how do you maintain that? I'm completely, <laughs> I'm at ease. I've had a lot of experience on stage, more so probably in front of people than any other way. You know, um, another way of describing it is, you know, my task is to sing and to make music and to resonate and to communicate. The audience's task is to listen and to like it or not like it. I decided I liked you guys. You're all my, you know, my... Uh, beloved comrades in this world and I'm going to go out and do my thing and that's all I needed to do mm -hmm. and for whatever reason that makes me comfortable and then Julie's comfortable and in doing so there are no mistakes the other thing is you know I, uh, uh, when you work with a lot of new composers living composers mm -hmm. which is kind of weird in this business because it shouldn't be but it is I do that a lot. You realize the Schubert's and the Schumann's. You know, Schubert, he had a, a favorite singer that sang his songs. Mm -hmm. The guys translated them into Italian and ornamented them. He didn't care. He transposed them to whatever. He just wanted him to sing his songs. Mm -hmm. They were people. They had the same experience that you and I had. They weren't aren't Beethoven too. You know, they're not on a pedestal. They're not non-human. They're very human. 
and they don't expect perfection like somebody typing out something and getting all the words right. They expect perfection like it's you in the moment, completely engaged and getting the point of the music across, not necessarily. It's like um, the big story again in Billy Budd is, do you follow the letter of the law or the spirit of the law, right? Mm. And Veer's big mistake was he followed the letter of the law because mm. he was cowardly rather than the spirit of the law. When you get up on stage, my job is to follow the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. The letter of the law is for the practice room. That's all. <laughs> did, did all that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to practice up here for you guys. <laughs> I'm going to... No one wants to don't say you see that. I'm going to just put it out there. And, you know, it's funny. Some shows, uh, I was doing a, the, the show that Mandy and I do together. And we were in Ravinia, which is outside of Chicago. It was a big venue and like 105 degrees. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's really hot. Mm -hmm. And I had a suit on. He's, you know, man, doing his Mandy thing. He's got t-shirt pants. He's sweating <laughs> like crazy. And I think they were doing the Homeland at the time. So he has a beard and you know, okay. whatnot. And, and uh, it's a, an hour and 40 minutes into this. And it's the last song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And I started out. And for whatever reason, the, the text in that song, if you really think about it, doesn't make a lot of sense. It's hard to put it in the right order. And I started, and I'm like, Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly birds fly and I'm like that's not right and I just stopped I'm like Julie I can't remember the words I'm like Mandy I forgot the words I have no idea the words and he's like Nathan do you want me to sing it in Yiddish he sang it to me in Yiddish and this is happening in front of you know 10,000 or so people oh, goodness. <laughs> and it was some it was probably most people's favorite moment of the whole show watching that real thing happen and so, you know, mistakes happen, but yeah. it doesn't mean they have to be bad. It just means they're mistakes. My twins, my last two are sort of a mistake, and they're I'm wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think also, um, you know, when you see those moments as well, like you said, um, they can be some of the audience's favorite moments because they show that you're human. And also, yes. in that encore as well, you did, you know, when <laughs> Julie was playing, you yeah. said, it's in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really yeah. Yeah, 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 because, uh, well... Yeah. We wanted to do it, but I also wanted to make sure it was the right key. Right? Yeah, I'm not yeah. gonna be embarrassed by saying Yeah. Yeah. And and once again, if you were if it were just you and you're in our living room, that's what I would have said. Okay. And that's the kind of relationship I want with the audience. Mm. A very friendly and, and yeah. um, back and forth one. Yeah. And, and and going back to I guess what you said about the relationship between composers and that idea of of I suppose perfection I suppose maybe mm -hmm. what you were saying maybe we can think of this idea of completeness rather than mm -hmm. I suppose like you were saying sticking to the the law of the law of the land I yeah, suppose right. mm -hmm. yeah I think of written music as it's kind of the it's like poetry I mean it, it, there's certain poetry that you need to look at it and read it because it's actually a piece of art by looking at it in mm -hmm. and of itself like scripture when these guys are you know the monks wrote this beautiful, I mean, part, part of the beauty of it is not just the words, but it's how they, what it looks like. But music generally is not that, you know, it, 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 those, it's just the skeleton. And what we do is we put, we make it human. We breathe life, life into it and give it flesh and blood. And, and if you stick to the, just the music, all you're going to get is a weird representation of it. It's not as gross as what I'm about to say. It's kind of like, to me, being really hungry and ordering a hamburger and putting it in your mouth and chewing it and then spitting it out rather than swallowing it. I feel like music, you have to bite into the burger and you have to chew it, savor it and swallow it, right? That's what I do on stage. If I were just to do the notes, it would be like, I'm gonna have a bite and then I'm gonna taste it and spit it out. You'd think that's so unnatural and so not human and so weird, but for whatever reason, some people decide to hide behind the, I'm going to pretend to eat this hamburger. Yes, exactly. You know, and I'm enough, honestly, of an introvert. I'm, I really am not a extroverted person, like on the scale. Really? Oh my gosh, yeah. And a lot of my colleagues are, they're very reluctant artists. But the desire to communicate, it's the best way I communicate with people. And that's a very natural thing to want. I can't do it at a half measure. Mm -hmm. I really have to be all in. All my friends know that too. It's very much yes or no, you know, peace or war kind of, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in or I'm out. It's really eh, yes. sort of in. I just, yeah. I, I can't do that. It's not yeah. my nature. It seems like 
a waste of my time and a waste of your time and mm. and so I suppose it actually is kind of a good thing mm. when you think about mm. some some people do I guess just want to bite the burger though and yeah that, just, they're, yeah they're histrionic or they or they're lazy and they kind of do their thing and or they don't have respect for the audience you know I I always think they bought a ticket they're there that that's huge. I mean, it really is huge that, you know, all of the work that the person does or however they've spent their life and their thoughts and their actions and transform that into, uh, you know, a, a certain number of pounds. And then they gave that work and hard work and time and everything to come in and listen to what I have to say. The only thing, it's my duty as a human being. It's, I mean, it's it, it would be a, a incredibly disrespectful not to give them what they've come to what they come for mm. and so that's what I do mm. it's exhausting I have to say it's kind of like you have to kind of burn hot you know but and when you do it's it's tiring but it's so enjoyable mm. and then it's gone <laughs> and why do you sing why do I sing yes I sing because of that very reason. It's the way I most purely communicate to other people. I don't have to come up with the words. I don't have to come up with the music. You know, if those, if those, if the music and the words resonate with something that I believe or something I hold dear or some human experience that I think is important, I can take that perfect little thing and express it to another person. And, and that, that it's literally the act of doing it. I don't have a desire to paint and put it on a wall and have somebody look at it. And I really have a, a desire to communicate directly with other people. And, and that's, I don't know why, I mean, who knows why, but it, it just gives me, you know, great pleasure. And, you know, and that trans, you know, it translates a little bit. There's also a pleasure now in doing that because I've, I enjoy being um, able to give an example of that to young people that are coming to watch so they know oh that's you know that's what I that's what I want to do and let them then make the choice and and and, and do that and and um, that's a new stage in my life to there's no oh I'm thinking about my career I mean I've kind of won all the awards I want to win I've sung so many great things in so many great places blah 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 and the whole point literally is not that stuff is that hour and a half with those people sitting in the audience and if i could play the cello i'd probably do that but i can't <laughs> okay. i can play the ukulele a little bit but it's such a pleasure talking to you thank you thank you